<laughs> Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, I'm sorry, Bob, you're all set? Okay. Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag, and the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. Plus, of course, there's an impeachment. <laughs> ah, Mr. Catino. There he is. How are you? Welcome. We're, we already started. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Public forum. Residents are invited to share ideas, opinions, or ask questions regarding town government. Uh, with the exception of Mr. Harrow, is there anyone out there that would like to say something? <laughs> I don't even need to sit down. I come to sing the praises of a town employee, Mr. Ben Sweeney, who dotted I's and crossed T's and jumped through hoops and got us a grant for working on invasive stuff on the White Hall Conservation property. Nice. I nice. wanted to make sure that everyone knows what a good job he did. That's great. Thank you, Ed. That news is Thank usually you. bittersweet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. In case the people at home didn't pick up on that, the invasive species is bittersweet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't pick up on it. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right, so we will now start with the police department interviews. The select board will interview three academy police officers. What does an academy police officer mean? Sure, the chief explain. Yeah. Academy or student police officers basically meaning that uh, we will initially uh, get approval to um, hire them to move on the process. Um, so we have uh, three candidates and um, it's, it's awfully hard around the state to okay. get people into the uh, the academy. So uh, we're looking at a time period of May for the police academy, okay. and then once they uh, graduate from the academy, they'll come back in front of the board okay. and be sworn. Okay. So through the chair, yes, sir. By way of explanation, yes, I am respectfully requesting the select board to authorize the hire of one additional police officer. Uh, this will bring the total number of officers at HPD up to 28, including three administrative staff and 25 frontline staff. Why the additional officer? Two reasons. The recently concluded strategic plan calls for additional resources and the specific emphasis on the needs that come through the school resource division. Secondly, the budget proposed by the chief through a collaborative process um, involving the officers in the department uh, calls for the addition of one police officer. Therefore, the question is, why do this now if this is being requested in the FY21 budget? Here's why. We already have funds in hand through the legacy funds cross community agreement. Mm -hmm. The fifth amendment provides for resources to be made available to the town. Why this was done was that the review and analysis of the impact of the project identified that there will be specific public safety needs brought to the town even before, even before the income taxes from that property become available. So the answer is we have funds in hand. Secondly, hiring the position now will give us a head start in bringing an officer onto the force. Here's what this means practically. And this is based on my continuing discussions with the HPD team. Getting the officer to the academy now means that when the schools open next year in September, mm -hmm. we will have that school resource officer trained and ready to serve. As we all know, we live and breathe the Boston Marathon here in Hopkinton. We know very well that planning for the marathon is a long-term labor-intensive process. 
and thus having this officer in hand will free up the administrative staff to focus on that very important role. And I've also heard that having an officer in place trained will allow our police department to have a minimum of three officers for each shift. And thus, I am respectfully requesting that the board authorize the town manager to fund one additional officer. Again, the main reason being the need has been identified, it's been articulated in the budget, we have the funds in hand, and this gives us a head start in getting somebody onto the force earlier rather than later. Thank you, Mr. Kamalo. Uh, Chief, the 28 officers, that'll give you three officers per shift, is that plus a sergeant? Or is that inclusive of a sergeant? Uh, that will include include a sergeant. Okay. But we, uh, we've, we've increased our ranks in, in that field to have uh, a great deal, I would say about 80% uh, supervision coverage. Okay. All right, so are the applicants here? Mr. Chair, I'm yes, sorry. Yes, sir, I'm sorry. Before we go to the applicants, and and I look forward to meeting everyone. I'm just a little confused as to who is the hiring committee for this position. Uh, in the past, we have not been the hiring committee per se. We are introduced to candidates after they go through a process, and then we generally say hello and kind of say, okay, let's proceed. But it seems like we're inserting ourselves a little earlier in that process. Good question. Not exactly. Um, as we know, the hiring authority for police officers is the select board. And in this case, thankfully, we have had a hiring process in place to replace three police officers. That hiring process went through uh, a written examination, two interview panels, uh, physical and background checks, psychological tests, and we are now at that point where the three officers identified can be moved on to the police academy. And this is the appropriate place of inserting the board as the hiring authority. Have we done it this way in the past? I believe, yes. I remember one of the recent officers, was it uh, Officer Sankioni? Uh, before going to the academy camp before the board, most recently. That's the one I well, remember. Well, an individual may come yes. before the board because it's gone, they, they have gone through a process and yeah. that process has narrowed it to one individual. Yes. It's my understanding that's not where we are tonight here. Yeah. We, we have three officers because we have three vacancies. So that translates to one officer per vacancy. I'm only getting further confused, Mr. Kamala. Yeah, so we have three yes. officers before yep. us this evening. Yes. We have three open positions, is that correct? Correct. But we're only going to hire one officer? We're going to hire three. Three. Why did I think we were hiring one? I did too. We already hired one. Yes. Remember, we already hired one. Yeah. A few weeks back. I don't know if you were here. I was so not here. Okay. So that, that explains some of this. Exactly. I was not here for that meeting. Yeah. I had to oh, step out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So we hired one then. Yeah. Yep. Yes. And we have three additional applicants. Yes. And we have three additional positions. Yes. So we have three and three, Mary Jo. Okay. Okay, that's, I'm a little, that's where I was off a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And those three that we're going to talk with this evening, they've been through the hiring process that I thought we would typically have outside this Exactly. Okay. As I say, starting back okay. from... So now it makes sense. Yeah. Great. Yep. Thank you. As always, you've clarified my thought. You're welcome. So, <coughs> Chief, do we have all three here? Yes. yes, we do. Yeah. All right. So, so, Mr. Kamalu, I have not been part of uh, something as a, certainly as a chair or even as a select men, board member, however you'd like to say it. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll call the first applicant. Yes. Um, Any? We have our packets in front of us. Yes. So... What do we have? We have uh, Brittany Firth. Yeah, Brittany Firth, and in your packet we have five questions, one question per board member. Okay. And then we have John Gardina. Is it Gardina? Is that the next one? Uh, yeah, that's yeah. correct. And then number three would be Nathan Wright. Okay. All right. 
Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi, Brittany. How are you doing? I'm Brian. Hi, Brittany. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Fine to speak. So where's Brittany's? Is there three First different ones? So if you take this packet out. out. Sheet up. Yeah. It'll say. Mr. Kamal, these are personnel matters, so these folders are going back to you at the conclusion of this discussion, is that correct? Correct, yes, and okay. your written comments will become part of the record in the personnel yeah, so notes. Anything written on here is in that, yep. right? Yep. Thank you for that, Mr. Kirk. Just trying to keep I appreciate the parliamentarian that. job alive and well in how to that. All right, so <clears throat> each one of us are going to ask you one question, and um, so by means of introduction, Mr. Kamala, would it be appropriate for us to have her identify herself and tell us a little bit about herself, and then we can ask the question? Yes, very briefly. All right. Yeah. So, Brittany, um, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little, about, a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Brittany Firth. Um, I graduated from Framingham State University uh, this past spring um, from their honors program uh, with a bachelor's in criminology and a minor in psychology. Um, I've been working um, as a part-time dispatcher in Hopkinton for um, almost three years. Um, and I've been working as a full-time dispatcher in Ashland as a fire dispatcher since September full-time. Uh, so why don't we start with Mr. Nasrullah. Why don't you open the questions? We have a list of five here. You can ask anyone you want. Your sure. call. So if you could please describe for me your approach to uh, de-escalating aggressive verbal or physical behavior. Sure. So, um, you know, being a dispatcher, um, a lot of the calls we get, people are very panicked or nervous or even sometimes angry. Um, so through dispatching, I've learned a lot about de-escalating situations just by, like, using a calm voice, using a calm tone, um, talking slowly. So I think I could definitely apply that to... Um, you know, real life situations as an officer. Um, Mr. Catino. So here in Hopkins, we're big in community policing. Um, how would you contribute to Hopkins Police Department to make it more proactive within the community? Definitely. Um, I really love that Hopkinton is like really pro community policing. You know, we have like the senior dinner and stuff like that, the fishing derby. Um, you know, I've helped out with like national night out and stuff like that. Um, I always think it's good to, you know, have involvement with the community, form bonds within the community, um, you know, reaching out to, you know, people who maybe need help or maybe don't have, giving them resources that maybe they don't have, providing them with resources, someone to reach out to that they feel comfortable with. Do you have any, if I may do the chair to follow up, do you have, do you have any, any other um, uh, ideas for some, uh, some, some activities or something, you know, uh, uh, on the line of, of that, that you might uh, think that we may be lacking that could bring uh, the community in, to, you know, whether it be to, to the schools or to, to seniors or whatever? Sure. Um, maybe having, like, a senior liaison appointed, like someone, like a, a point that people can reach out to. You know, a lot of times seniors are worried to reach out to family members. They don't want them to think that they can't live on their own and stuff like that. So maybe having um, an officer, like, designated to having, like, seniors reach out and to answer their questions and stuff like that would be a good idea. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mary Jo. Well, I, I just want to go back for one minute. And you, you described your approach to de-escalating, uh, and you talked about your approach to dispatching. How about face-to-face, one-on-one? I think you can still um, really use, like, a lot, like, like remaining calm. Um, you know, people tend to, like, mirror your actions. So um, remaining calm, keeping a calm tone, um, you know, lowering your voice. People tend to lower their voice. Um, you know, just remaining, you know, confident and calm and not letting things get to you and stuff like that. Okay. What is it about Hoppington that makes you attractive to you, makes you want to come here? Definitely. So, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with, like, the roads and the layout of the town just from working here. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of working with all the officers, and I respect them all um, a great deal. I'm familiar with all of them. Um, 
you know, and also about like the community policing. A lot of towns, they don't, you know, have community as much involvement with the community. Um, so I think it's really great that, you know, you're able to form relationships within the community and um, police officers, like people will reach out to them because they feel comfortable, they don't feel afraid. And um, I just think it's a, a really great department and they're very professional. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, full disclosure, I am a trustee at Framingham State University, oh. sitting on the board of trustees there. <laughs> and I believe I've met Brittany in the past. Possibly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> she's a very successful student, as I understand it, and I do think I have met her in the past for good reasons. Uh, so welcome. I'm excited to see you here this evening. What is your vision for your professional future? Um, you know, I would definitely, um, within the next five years, I'd like to like start um, my master's in criminology or criminal justice um, and complete that within the next five years. Um, as far as, I mean, I would love to be a full-time police officer, um, be really involved with like the schools. Um, I, I would like to be involved more with like the senior community um, and really just, you know, move forward in the... Um, like move up in the department. Okay. Thank you. So after <clears throat> successfully completing your field training, generally the uh, Hopkins police officers are alone on patrol. How does the role of teamwork fit into the in this practice of working alone? Um, a lot of it's communication, especially through like radios and stuff like that. Um, you always want to make sure you're keeping dispatch and the other um, officers updated. You know, it really is like a a team thing between dispatch, like giving them information so they know where you are, so they know you're safe, um, and same thing with the other officers, helping each other out when you need it, um, backing people up. Yep, that's huge. All right. Um, so, do you have any uh, or board collectively? Do we have anything further we'd like to ask her? Brittany? No. Anything? I, I'd just like to say, you know, thanks for, for you know, for coming in, you know, facing, facing the five of us at the big table. <laughs> Thank you, know, you guys for reading you're, you're, really you're really doing a, you know, a great job. I just yeah. want to commend you for, for all your answers and, and you know, and, and, and staying calm under pressure. You're, you're, you're actually answering some of the questions right here by just your demeanor. Thank so, you. So really, thank you very much. You're doing a great job. Thank you. All right. Uh, in summation, anything you want to say to us? I just want to thank you all for, you know, meeting with me and for your time. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Good luck. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Have a good night. Good luck. All right. John Gardina. Is that who's next? Yep. Yep. Good evening. Hi there. Hey, How John. You yes, sir. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you for having me. Um, so, John, what we had Brittany do, we're going to have you all do for so we're all uh, very consistent in our approach. Why don't you tell us a little bit about us? And um, I'm sorry, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, we could tell you a little bit about us. I don't want to hear about us. <laughs> um, he doesn't want to hear about us. And then, uh, and then we'll each ask you one question, and then uh, we'll set you free. Absolutely. All right. Uh, so, nice to meet you all. My name is John Jardina uh, from Hyde Park, Massachusetts. Uh, 29 years old. Uh, my recent experiences have allowed me to become a special state police officer at Boston University Medical Center. Um, once I obtained that certification from passing the interim, uh, Intermittent Reserve Academy, I was also able to become a specialized bike officer, a field training officer for some of the new recruits, as well as a dispatcher. Um, I, I might be biased, but I personally feel like the environment that that hospital is in is, is a place where you can really obtain some of the best experience I possibly could, um, seeing as it's, you know, in a, a renowned location, also called Methanol Mile, the Mass Ave. Albany Street area, you're faced with a lot of um, different situations. You communicate with a lot of different walks of life, all while also you know protecting the, the campus, the faculty, the staff, the students, uh, and most importantly the patients. So 
that's what I have been doing. Um, and, you know, I'm looking forward to this opportunity to hopefully join this department, join this community, and be a part of the Hopkins team. So you went to Curry College, Arlington, Catholic. Any sports there? I did hockey, sir. Is that right? <laughs> yes, sir. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Not much of a hockey guy. <laughs> the skating part, anyway. Rob Davies, your coach by chance? Was he still there then? He was. <laughs> Winthrop, Boston University. Yep. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, like I said, we're going to ask a couple of questions here for you. Uh, so, Mary Jo, why don't you start us off next? Okay. Any one, not the same one. I'm going to mix it up. I'm going to make you read them all. Well, I, I wanted to know was what, what we read the first time the last time was, uh, would you describe your approach to de-escalating uh, aggressive or uh, verbal and physical behaviors in sure. interaction? So, uh, I mean, that's something that we faced a lot uh, in the Boston University Medical Center area. And I think, uh, first and foremost, when you, when you go to a scene like that, you want to make sure that everyone is safe. Uh, you want to make sure that the two parties involved or the, or the party involved um, doesn't need any medical attention. But when you, when you approach somebody, you want to try to come in at an even, even keel. You don't want to be, you don't mm -hmm. want to come in too hot. I, I've found from not only the, uh, the Reserve Academy, but also my work experience, that when you come almost like at an a approachable basis, you know, you can always move higher if needed. So you want to kind of find a middle ground and see, you know, sir, can I, sir, ma'am, can I help you? Uh, what seems to be the problem, or what, what transpired? What do you need help with? Um, when you have that approach, approachableness, and, and that mentality, I feel as people will kind of find that common ground and, and slowly try to trust you. And I trust, I think, was what uh, really helps de-escalate situations. They know that you're not just somebody who's going to you know, automatically assume that they're wrong and point fingers first. You really want to hear both sides. Uh, that's kind of how I would approach that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Herr. Mr. Ted Stone, if it would be okay, I'd like to ask one question slightly off topic, but I think pertinent. Uh, John, in, in your application, it says you've got one credit left to receive your BA. Yes, sir. Is, there, is that still current? Are you working on that? Yes, sir. And your plan is to finish that? Absolutely. Great. Uh, second question. How would you contribute to the Hopkinton Police Department to make it more proactive within the community? Well, one of the things that I found is, uh, you know, Hopkinton was labeled one of the safest towns. And from my approach, I feel as if aggressive patrols will lead to crime deterrence. So being visible, having a community policing aspect where people in the community see you, you're, you're out and about, um, you're approachable for them to come for you if you need any help, and being aggressive on those, those direct patrols of the buildings of the the areas that are most uh, problematic, for lack of a better term, um, is something that you know would help uh, the town of Hockington in that aspect. Okay, thank you, Mr. Catino. Great certifications. Thank you, sir. Way to go. Um, you know, in, in that vein, what's your vision for your professional future? Well, sir, I've, I've been working very hard to, you know obtain a, a position like this. Um, I found that Hoppington would be a great fit. I'm looking to get out of the city. I want to be a part of a community that really um, I can dig my roots in. Uh, I actually took a drive up here yesterday with my girlfriend, who is a, a big support system of mine. And we sat down at the, uh, uh, the Spoon over on, on Lumber Street. <laughs> Never heard of it. Had breakfast, had breakfast there. And, and you know, when we sat there and we were looking around, it really was refreshing to see that everyone who walked through that door said hi or knew everybody in that in that place and you don't have that in the city and so with that with going through this process i really feel as if um hawking would be a great fit for a 30 plus year career if warranted and that's something that i want and i think that's something that my my family and my and my girlfriend's on board with and and that's uh my drive i really want to be a career police officer in a community like this and just the fact that um that a, a board such as yourself wants to applicants and the candidates to, to come forth and, and speak and meet you guys. It really speaks volumes, and, and thank you guys for having me. Great, great answer. Thank you very much. Our friend. John, you're doing great. Thank <laughs> you, sir. Very impressed. <clears throat> um, 
I'd like you to kind of uh, expand on what it is about Hopkinton and its police department, specifically the, the, the police department itself, uh, that attracted you to, uh, to want to work in this community. Absolutely. Especially coming from the city. Well, first and foremost, I, I really uh, admired the fact that Hopkinton has their own private test. I think that gives a real even keel for all the applicants involved. Um, living in the city, if you're not a veteran and taking a civil service exam, it kind of sets you back a little bit. Um, I felt as <coughs> my current experiences, my credentials that I've received from that um, experience would definitely be an asset for a department like this. It's a very progressive department. It's looking to expand. It's looking to hire. Um, everyone that I've met in this process has been nothing short but great. And, um, you know, being not only being a, a safe town, but being an area where I can see myself living and digging my roots in, like I stated before, really gives me that, you know, drive. I, I'm very excited about this. Uh, I don't think words could actually really describe uh, how badly I want this position. Um, but I definitely, I definitely see myself and my future family being here. Thank you. All right, John. So after successfully completing field training, generally Hopkins police officers are alone on patrol. Uh, how does the role of teamwork fit into the practice of working alone? I, I think teamwork is everything nowadays in, in police work and law enforcement. Um, you know, maybe not pertaining to, to Hopkins per se, but I think law enforcement now is really portrayed in a, in a negative light, unfortunately. And I feel like having that team mentality and having known that you have an officer not too far away to have your back if anything does go south, you know, that's, that's a huge, you know, huge weight lifted off your shoulders per se. Um, sometimes situations can get hairy, um, but, you know, when you really trust your, for lack of a term, brothers being a part of the, the department, um, and females, of course, uh, it's, it's a nice mentality to have. And you can really accomplish a lot because when you're dealing with a situation, and let's just say for any odd reason that individual you're talking to picks something about you that they don't like, knowing that you have a backup that could come in and give a different approach, uh, speak to somebody in a different light that they might have a better way of uh, reasoning with. So I think the team, team mentality is definitely something that is most necessary in, in a law enforcement aspect. So how long did you work at BU or at uh, Methadone Mile? Three years, sir. Three years. So I have a friend that's a pretty high-ranking guy on the Mass State Police. Yes, sir. And I spent uh, four years working at the maximum security prison. Wasn't didn't live there. I worked there. <laughs> and, um, the, the guy from the state police said that all the college in the world, you go to 15 years of college, it doesn't equal one year of work experience. And some of his best recruits were people that did 10 months to a year as a CO. They were able to sniff out a criminal. Anything more than a year, he didn't want. But 10 months to a year, saw the anatomy of what a real criminal is, how they, how they can baffle you with their stories and cover it up. I think that you, with those three years experience on Methadone Mile, chances are you're gonna be able to find someone with, you know, you're gonna be able to kinda of, to work your way through the stories of the opioids and you'll be able to see signs and symptoms of if they're on opioids and things like that. That's giant in today's society, that opioids is everything. And, um, it's, it's nice, um, and it, I find it kind of fitting that I'm asking you about uh, teamwork, where you were a hockey player at Curry and Arlington. And, um, so obviously, you can't, like, team has been, teamwork has been bred into you. If you, may, if you played four years with Rob Davies, <laughs> I know Rob pretty well. Two. Two. Uh, he left, unfortunately, halfway through, but yeah. So if you played for Rod Davies at all, there was no choice on teamwork. You, you, teamwork was ingrained in you, and same thing in, in Arlington. So the teamwork is, is great. You're coming into a department that is uh, one of the best in the, <coughs> in the state, if not the country. Um, they all work very well together. Um, you know, it's just a, I call it a well-oiled machine. And, uh, we said to Jessica the other day when, when she came through the interview process that it's kind of like, hitting the Powerball after you hit all the other numbers on your, on your uh, lottery ticket. So it's a great town to work in. Um, I like your resume. I like the fact that you've worked in the field that is kind of prevalent in today's um, uh, society. And um, I, like your, I like your concept on the, on the teamwork. So 
that's the only question that I have. Board, before we move on, does anyone have anything for John? What was your plus minus in college? Uh, well, if when I saw the ice, <laughs> first off, uh, probably in the negative, unfortunately. Right, yeah, yeah. I, I didn't play a huge role, but you know, um, I gr grew up playing hockey my entire life, baseball. I'm also the oldest of three, so I feel like I've always taken on more of like a, a leadership and parental role with yep. them, given my uh, my family dynamic. So I feel like uh, I can definitely bring a lot to to the department when warranted. So <laughs> thank you guys again for allowing me to come out here, and it's very nice to meet you all. Thank you. So there's one more class for that BA, right? Yes, sir. Well, test out, sir. I'm sorry? It's a test out, sir. Test out? Yes, sir. Cool. But you're going to get that done? <clears throat> Absolutely, sir. Don't call him, sir. It's going to go right to his head. <laughs> <laughs> all right, John. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Thank you all very much. All right. So next up, we have Nathan Wright. Nathan, how are you? Very good, sir. Have a seat. Thank you. Welcome. So, Nathan, we, um, we're all going to ask you one question. And um, before we ask the question, we've asked the other two applicants to go ahead and tell us a little bit about themselves. We'll ask the question, we'll close, and then uh, we'll set you free. Perfect, sir. All right. So, um, obviously, my name is Nathan Wright. Um, I have a bachelor's degree from Fitchburg State University and a master's degree from the University of Massachusetts Lowell. I've also uh, graduated a reserve academy from uh, Boylston in 2016. Uh, I've been in the Army for about eight years. Uh, I started off as an enlisted soldier as a forward observer. Uh, after about three years, I commissioned as a second lieutenant in the 101 Infantry from 101. Uh, ROTC. 101? Uh, 181. <clears throat> Excuse me. So. Um, after uh, I graduated, I did a few security jobs, um, various unarmed armed security, and then I deployed in 2017 to 18 to Egypt, where I led a platoon of soldiers on a uh, peacekeeping mission. Uh, basically, what we did was we kept the peace between Egypt and Israel. After that, I came back and uh, began a job at the College of the Holy Cross as a police officer. Uh, I'm married. I have a wife. Uh, We've known each other since uh, high school. Well, we've only been married for about seven months now. Uh, dated since uh, March 2015. Uh, I live in Worcester, no kids, and hopefully one day I'll get a dog because they're awesome. <laughs> yep. I have a, a few hobbies. Uh, one of the weirder ones is I actually uh, kind of like ferment foods. So I just started fermenting hot sauce and sauerkraut. My platoon sergeant actually got me into it. It's not something that's pretty common, but it's a neat little thing. you got to kind of watch this stuff. There's a little bit of science involved, so I like doing that. What's the benefit of fermenting hot sauce? <laughs> so, actually, it has really good flavor. It's, it's very, the flavor is really well developed after the uh, peppers ferment, and if you don't add vinegar to it, you get a probiotic effect that's good for your uh, digestion. So you're saying if I put fermented hot sauce on my chicken wings, it's healthy? Yes. Perfect. That's my justification. I'd like to have your <laughs> hand. Yeah, I'm actually that's my wife on Sunday. Huh? All right. So, uh, Mr. Catino, why don't you start us off? Okay. All right. Just, oh, shoot. That won't work. That's what I wanted to ask. One second. Um, Mary Jo, why don't you start us off? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I have, for one thing, I have a Korean sister-in-law, or you used to have one, and you have not tasted anything hotter than her kimchi in this whole world. <laughs> That's on my list of things to try Whoa. to have. And it goes down, and then it gets hot. It doesn't get <laughs> hot first. No warnings. Okay. Um, I'm going to start off with the same question that I've been asking everybody. How would you de-escalate uh, an aggressive situation both verbally and physically. So when it comes to de-escalation, I've learned it, it really depends on the individual and then the circumstance involved. Um, I, I've dealt with uh, a few violent individuals in my time uh, as a police officer and doing security beforehand, and only one time have I not been able to de-escalate that situation, unfortunately. So what I found is talking to people in a calm manner and kind of just paying attention to what they're kind of focusing on is the best way to 
figure out what you need to do to kind of bring them back down to a level where they might not act out uh, violently or continue to escalate themselves. Uh, it, it really depends on the person. It, I've seen all kinds of reactions. Um, and sometimes people are just acting in a manner just because they want someone to actually listen to them. So you have to, you have to be an active listener in order to successfully de-escalate someone and use that verbal judo that you learn through various ways of communication or talking to people that you've seen before. Thank you. Welcome, ma'am. Mr. Herr. Nathan, uh, after successfully completing field training, generally Hopkinton police officers are alone on patrol. <coughs> How does the role of teamwork fit into this practice of working alone? So while you're alone in the cruiser, you're, you're not actually alone. Um, you still have your fellow officers on the road, and if you need help, you know that they're going to be coming to aid you, and if they need help, you'll be going to aid them. So while, while you're individual in the cruiser, you're not actually alone because you have your entire team on shift with you, willing to help you and you willing to help them in any situation that requires it. Thank you. Sir? Our friend. Nathan, it seems like you have uh, quite the experience. Thank you, sir. And um, it's very impressive. Um, what do you... What is your vision for your professional future? So, um, on the civilian side, uh, I will obviously would like to uh, be hired and become a police officer here. Uh, within five to ten years, I'd like to become a sergeant so that I can uh, kind of develop newer officers and expand my leadership role that I've taken from the military into my civilian career. Um, and that's kind of where I see myself within five to ten years in the civilian side. Uh, and in the military side, within about two years, I should be a company commander leading about uh, 100 soldiers. And then in about 10 years, a major overseeing battalion operations. So you're continuing with, continuing with your military? Yes, sir. Um, I, I've been in the military for eight years now. I intend to uh, continue for another 12 years and uh, maybe retire after my 20 years in the Guard. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, sir. John? Excellent. Okay, well, um, often we're really big on community policing. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it, that, that's what I believe led to our great uh, safety rating as one of the safest communities in the country. Um, how would you contribute to Hopton Police Department to make it um, more proactive in the community? Do you have any ideas of, of uh, expanding that? So uh, where I work now is it's a reactive department, uh, unfortunately. Um, I try to be more proactive than some of my fellow officers at Holy Cross, and the way I do that is I actually go out. I go into the buildings, I speak to students, I, I look around and see where there might be problems and try to go out, talk to people to figure out solutions to those problems. Um, police officers work for the community, not against it. So as, as police officers, we need to actually interact with the community, talk to them and actively listen to them to figure out what the problems they are having and be part of the solution with them to solve them. Excellent. Thank you very much. You really, uh, to to uh, Mr. Nasrullah's uh, comments, you've got, you've got some great experience that you bring into the town. Thank, thank you. you, sir. Nathan, first and foremost, thank you for your service. Thanks for the support. Um, what is it about, the, uh, about Hopkinton and its police department that attracted you to want to work in this community as a police officer? So, um, while I was working uh, one of my normal shifts, I was approached by uh, Sergeant Brennan. Um, he, had, he started talking to me, like, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay here? I told him, hey, I want to be a municipal police officer. I can serve a wider community. So he told me that Hoppington was actually taking the test. So me and him got to talking. I told him some about my experience. He, he suggested that I apply. So I did, and then I started researching the town. And I've seen a lot of good things on the town website, uh, the police Facebook page, the YouTube channel. Uh, the news, uh, the, the online uh, news website. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of good things to this town, and um, talking to my wife, we, we've kind of like looked at Hopkinton as a place where we can actually settle down and raise our family, really. Uh, it's great schools, the community is great. It's very uh, inclusive as well, which is something that I like. So it, it's just, it's something, one of those like small towns that has a sense of community that attracts me to where I want to be. Um, the military has a 
it's a weird community, but there's just a, a kinship that I want to have in my it's kind of like everyday life that I don't necessarily get from other places. Yep, that's a great answer. Thanks, sir. Um, board, Mr. Hur. Mr. Ted, a little <coughs> off topic, if I could, please. Uh, Nathan, uh, the town of Hopkinton had a student uh, involved in the mm -hmm. Holy Cross uh, crash, unfortunately. Yep. And? Uh, yeah, and um, so how is the Holy Cross community as a whole doing <coughs> following that tragedy? They're hurting. Um, obviously, we had uh, Ms. Wright uh, passed away, and we have other students who are still in serious condition. Um, we've been trying to do what we can to assist with that. Uh, we will be, our officers will be providing some transports to the students as they return to campus so that we can kind of ease a burden on them getting around to class. Um, we have our therapy dog, Gracie, uh, Golden Doodle. She's not fully trained yet, but we've been bringing her out to, into the community to the students so that they can kind of get a little bit of comfort in that. And um, the Holy Cross alumni community has actually done a lot for those students as well. People have been donating hotels, um, private jets that, to fly family members down. And um, one of uh, the students actually raised a quarter of a million dollars to put forward to his classmates, which is something that he didn't even expect either. So the, the entire community at Holy Cross has kind of come together to support these students and their families. And it, it's really nice to see that. Mm. Thank you. So it, it'll, it'll take a little bit of time for them to heal, but Time will eventually help them heal. Sometimes when it, you know, I, I don't consider Worcester or Holy Cross to be a, quote, small community, but sometimes it takes sentinel events such as something like that, or if something happens here, you see where the everybody kind of pulls together and gets along, puts all the petty stuff behind them and, and sees things for what it is. So uh, it's nice to see that when a sentinel event like that happens, uh, your department and your community at Holy Cross pulls together and that you, you notice that and kind of foster it, so. It's and nice. if I may, Mr. Chairman, you, you, you answered the uh, community policing question right there. You know, you had, you had all of those ideas right in your head. So, uh, great follow-up. Thanks, sir. Mr. Kamalo, <clears throat> move us forward, please. Thank you. Um, again, through the chair, Ed, thank you for your service. Yes, sir, thank you. Yeah, at this point, um, if the board is so inclined, respectfully, the chair will entertain a motion to sponsor Brittany Feth, John Giardina, Nothing Right, to attend police academy training, and to appoint Brittany Feth, Jordan Giardin, John Giardina, and Nathan Wright as full-time police officers upon successful completion of the academy. So Second. moved. Second. Uh, further discussion? Mr. Cabral and candidates, please don't take any of these questions personally at all. It really is not involved in directly. Tell me about the financial piece of this again. I'm a little confused. So we have in our budget for FY20, funds for these positions, correct? Or no? Or those are allocated elsewhere? In the FY20 budget, we have funding for two positions. How do we fund the third position? As I said previously, we have now received funding from legacy farms to support public safety. We will, if the board is so inclined, use a portion of those funds to fund the third position. When will our financial obligation for these three positions begin? On completion of the... No. The town's financial obligation begins at the time the board decides to appoint them. Uh, and the board, the, the town will be funding their uh, positions through the academy process. So, so that's it. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So in effect, they come on the payroll now. They're paid while they go through the academy. And when they come out of the academy, we reappoint or finalize the appointment one more time. Yes. And they become full-time officers. Yes. But the, the financials kick in now. There's two of the three funded through the budget and one funded through the legacy, legacy 
clause in the HCA, which is a perfectly correct way to do it. Uh, okay, I'm good. So, Chief, what will these guys and girls be doing between now and May when they go to the academy? Oh, so we are going, we're going to pay them before they go to the academy? I'm sorry? If the academy starts in April. Uh, are we going okay. to appoint them now? So what happens between now and April? Yeah. yeah. That's my question. The appointment date will be decided as part of the administrative process. We'll have to sit down with the chief, understand when they may be going to the academy, and that date will be decided. Okay, so when, if we appoint them tonight, uh, they don't go on the payroll starting tomorrow. They go on the payroll pending a, a, a successful negotiation of probably you know, the day they go to the academy or something like that, right? Correct. In other words, the appointment will be effective at a date to be decided administratively by the police chief. Okay. Is that in your motion? So or is that in my motion? <laughs> so revised. Yeah, yeah so I, I want that in the motion, please, that Correct. terminology there. And if it's tomorrow, that's fine. I just want to make sure we account for the financials of this so the residents understand where we're at. So it's at a date to be determined through the administrative process. Thank you. You're seconding that? I accept this. Okay. Second, yeah. So Chief and Deputy Chief, these three applicants that we have here tonight, these are the three applicants that you think would be best served out of the interview pool that you went through? Yes, they uh, all three uh, did an excellent job in the written portion and uh, with uh, the two boards, uh, they are down to the, uh, the um, they were within the top five. There was a candidate that unfortunately uh, had to drop out of the process and we hired um, uh, uh, the other officer at an uh, earlier date who already had the academy. So uh, they all three are, are within the top five. They're all excellent candidates. Uh, one of the things I'm excited about is adding uh, a little more diversity to our police department. Uh, with the, with the, these three hires, we'll, we'll now be up to uh, three females on the police department, which is kind of rare in Lawrence. I Florida. thought you were saying you're hiring three females. I'm like, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It'll bring the total up to the three. As you all know, uh, we uh, lost uh, uh, Linda Higgins, who was a great officer on our police department, to uh, retirement. And, um, you know, we're trying to yep. fill her legacy. Yep. Yep, I saw Linda last week. It was nice yeah, to Is the deputy chief here in all in on all these as well? He was he was uh, you were in interview panel number two, correct? Two. With yes. the chief? Okay. Correct. And you're in agreement with the chief? Absolutely. Uh, I think I'm proud of all the candidates we've brought forward and the people that we have on board. We've hired a lot of people and interviewed far more. And as I sat in the audience and watched them it's just an example of the quality that they possess, and the answers were just so spot on. If this was a first-round candidate, it would be a no-brainer and probably a pre-draw conclusion that they're going to go all the way. So um, I already th congratulated them, and, uh, and we're proud of them. So glad to have them. So, Depp, as I was sitting here going through the interview process, I was trying to equate it, trying to, to uh, put myself in this seat when you went through the process. And, uh, <laughs> well, this was smaller. This was definitely smaller. Uh, yeah, and I, I look at, uh, at these three candidates in comparison to some of the, the all-stars that, uh, that came on back then. And uh, <laughs> apples and oranges, my friend. Apples and oranges. <laughs> Nothing personal. You're right there with them. But uh, I think Come some on, of them. I'm going to stay on the rocks. That's best. I'm just that's best. That's <laughs> best. Cheers. Thank you for the compliment, I guess, towards me. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you got it. You got it. All right, so we've had a, uh, a motion that's seconded. Is there any further yeah. discussion? So we have uh, we talked a little bit about the process and the timeline and this sort of administrative thing that we have to sort out, so I'm looking at the candidates now. Does that work with everybody as far as we don't know exactly when this happens, but when it happens, that's all good? Right? Yes, everybody sir. understands. I mean, this, is, this police stuff is new to me in general after 12 years, but still new. So everyone's good? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. No further discussion? Mr. Kamala, did you have something? If I may. You may. Through the chair, as I explained earlier, this has been a very long process. It may be appropriate to ask either the chief or the deputy chief or the HR director to recognize the individuals who have participated through this hiring process and made this possible. Sure. Absolutely. We had a, a great board, uh, first board at the station that consisted of uh, Sergeant O'Dale, 
um, Molly McGaffin. Uh, of course, uh, Jessica Lawrence was on uh, both interviews. Uh, Brian Santioni, the gay nine. He left his dog out of the interview. <laughs> Arthur Schofield, who's a, a great new young sergeant. They were on that, that first panel. Yeah. I'm not forgetting anybody for that first panel. No, that was uh, second panel was uh, myself, uh, the deputy, and Sergeant Aaron O'Neill and Jessica. And uh, they all did a great job. Um, we all know that um, HR is running short a little bit right now. And, um, you know, we've really been asking a lot of them. Mm -hmm. to, to, with a list, we started with a list of 75 candidates that took the test, and we narrowed it down to a, uh, a good, a good five candidates. And this will be the first time, probably in the history of Hopkins and PD, that three <coughs> police officers have attended the academy at the same time. Nice, excellent. Um, We're growing. HR, you're all on board with this, with these choices? Yes. Let the record show. We got one thumbs up and one nod. Yes. <laughs> yes, I am. All right. First in HR. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we've got a motion on the table. We have a second. We have no more further discussion. Nope. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Abstentions? That carries. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys. And Thank girls. Can I do a picture? Do a picture no, the, after the, you want to do a picture? After, after the academy? The, I think, yeah. Yeah, you can. After the academy. In their shiny uniform. In their uniform <laughs> and their badge. Let's go for an after. Now they all have a battle of the seniority in the academy. Yeah. <laughs> Goes by height. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Thanks. Good luck. Nice to meet you all. You too. All right. So, that being said, uh, we will move on to the FY21 budget discussion. Mr. Kamala. If I may, Mr. Chair. Get our HR uh, stuff back in. Yeah. You didn't write us a couple, couple of minutes. Uh, we have a guest up here. So to join the team. Put those wires. Party time? Yes, party time. Did I? Send in there. Uh, <laughs> share it. We work as a team. That's all right. Million, we're putting in debt service against 15 million. We wouldn't put in the straight up cash. So just, I think he accounted for it, assuming it was going to go through, but it's still an article. Yeah. So it goes up to vote on Mr. Yeah. Yeah. But we're going to talk about that tonight, I think. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Is this some of our school colleagues or no? Right? Yeah. When the music stops, grab a seat. I love these are okay. <laughs> Excellent. No. And did you guys have a budget advisory group meeting today? Yes. How'd that go? Towns. All right. Stand for one the rest here. I know. I know. So we have everyone else represented. Is there anybody missing? Sorry about that. Nice, let me know. Yeah, they do sometimes book up, but. Mr. Kamala, is there anybody not here? Not Mike, yeah, yeah. No, everybody's here. Okay. All right, welcome aboard, everyone. Good evening. So, I see we have everybody here. So, um, Mr. Kamala, why don't you kind of take us through a, a overview of what we're planning on doing tonight. Uh, this is just going to be a quick three or four minute thing of you guys explaining to us about your budget. Uh, closer to three than four. And um, take it away, Mr. Kamala. Great. Um, again, the instruction is pretty straightforward. You explain your budget, identifying what's different from previous years, 
and what's really important to find going forward. On January 7th and again on January 21st, I reported to the board on our budget development process. The status as of that last report was that I had issued a budget document that was in compliance with the explicit direction to deliver a starting point document that limits any spending increase to the 2.5% rise in the tax levy and to new tax revenue growth from new construction or improvements. The constrained budget provided an amount for the school department that was $1.3 million less than requested and approximately 291000 below what was requested by the other town departments. In the nine days since our last discussion on this topic, we have received some excellent news. Governor Becker has released a state budget proposal that calls for state aid to Hopkinton that is $356,000 higher than the projection we used in developing our budget. And on the expense side, the state budget shows that charges to us for state programs we are obliged to participate in will be $126,000 lower than we planned for. The net effect of these two changes is an improvement in our budget position of $482,000. And those newly identified funds could be used to fill a significant portion of the identified unmet need. Of course, there is still a lot of work to be done. As in the case every year, the spending plan under review deserves close scrutiny. And it is getting that scrutiny again tonight, the third specific budget discussion by the full select board in the month of January. Further, the budget working group, which includes leadership representation from the select board, the school committee, and the appropriation committee, has been meeting weekly to discuss budget developments and will continue to do so. Sadly, there have been false and inflammatory reports and rumors in the community that we are at the tail end of the budget process. But the truth is very much the opposite of that. We are in the very early phases of public discussion and review of this budget. We are continuing to refine and explore alternatives on the spending side. And as shown by our update on the proposed state budget, we are continuing to look closely at the revenue side as well. As I wrote in the budget transmitter memo and reiterated at our last meeting, the one town, one solution approach will be central to our eventual success in building towards a budget that balances community needs and tax affordability in the coming weeks and months. And at this point, with the Chair's permission, uh, we will now ask the department heads to go through their budgets. And uh, with your permission, I'll let uh, the CFO call out the departments to make their presentations. You're going on the clock, Tim. Perfect. Three minutes and 30 seconds. That's Perfect. what each first, of you people have. The first <laughs> section is the select board, and that is level funded, so we'll move right over to that one. $2,000 to support the expenses of the select board. Uh, what expenses? <laughs> Apparently, there's occasional travel. Yeah. No, By members of the select board? No, it, in fact, it's a conference registration and participation. Most recently, we had members participating in the MMA. Uh, we also pay for the subscription to receive the MMA publications. Okay, and then the town manager's budget is next. Yes, and, and to be clear, I, I think I understand why Mr. Hayes is asking the question. The select board members are not paid positions. Just, Just purely for expenses. Exactly. <laughs> I have never filed an expense report with the town of Hopkins. There is. Just saying. Yeah. Why don't you run again? That's where the free <laughs> cash comes from. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that ain't going to happen. Uh, the town manager budget? Yeah. The increase of 2.6% is for personal services and expenses are going up by 11.1%. Again, this is in relation to... Uh, some of the experiences that we have to put together for our transparency as well as public education processes. 
And the document we're working from is enclosure four of the budget memo, if you have that with you, which is the line by line budget. So our plan is to walk through enclosure four and enclosure five, which is the capital budget tonight. And that brings me to account 131, the appropriation committee. And I'm sorry, account 131. And account 131 is available to support extraordinary or unforeseen expenditures at the discretion of the appropriation committee. The $125,000 appropriation requested is consistent with the FY19 amount, which was unspent and reverted to free cash at the end of that year, and with this year's appropriation, which is unspent now. It's really a reserve account. State law would allow us to put as much as $3.6 million in that account so that the Appropriation Committee could drew, deal with true emergencies. <coughs> the town has always chosen to fund it at a much lower level with the plan to go back to town meeting if a major emergency arises. Oh, wait. Hang on a second. Then. We're sure. So at the bottom left of every page, it says which enclosure they are, and we're on enclosure four. So I have page two. I don't have page one. I do not have page one. I. Oh. <laughs> it's on our iPads. If, yes, it's, it's also on the iPads. If if you don't have it on the iPad, you check on the iPads. Well, here, you have this one. I've got the one I the meeting. And somebody copied. Looks like somebody copied single-sided copies of a double-sided document. So. Uh, Everyone on the odd pages would have a very easy night of it tonight if we didn't fix this, so we'll, we'll get right on it. So that's a level funding. Uh, as you get that document up, I'll just talk next about the next several accounts. Accounts 133 through 145 cover all the finance functions. And together, uh, you know, they're all broken out among accounting, procurement, the assessor, but together these accounts total $1,191,000 in costs. That amount is 1.24% of the proposed general fund budget. For your, so for your finance function, you're paying 1.2% of your general fund operating budget. That's down from 1.28% last year. As the town grows and we hold our finance costs steady, we're supporting operations for a lower fraction of the budget each year. And that is our, our plan and our intention, and we're doing it this year. Of the nearly $1.2 million we're asking for, 76% of the cost is for salaries for our 11 staff, and 24% is for other expenses. Taken together, this combined budget request is up $45,000 from last year across all the divisions in finance. Uh, almost all of the net increase, 94% of the increase we're asking for, is related to the cost of expanding our appraisal and tax appeal defense program from $109,000 to $151,500. And you can see that if you have page one of enclosure four as a third line in account 141. We believe that this spending to support our tax actions is a prudent investment for the town. For example, from FY18 to FY20, we spent $10,000 a year or $30,000 on personal property tax audits, and they resulted in $512,000 in new tax revenue collected. So the only area of budget growth we have is for additional work in this area that helps us do two things, collect taxes that are not being taxed, being collected, and make the tax burden fairer across all uh, taxpayers. And a big part of that involves the LNG litigation. There are several very small increases and decreases and other specific lines that offset each other. Without the increase for appraisal expenses, our budget request would be down from last year. Tim, what's up with the 75K for personal services under procurement and grants? So last year, Ben's position had been lumped in under uh, accounting, and we broke it out for more visibility. So you should see the accounting so line. Accounting, okay, minus 86, got it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, if there's no question, the legal budget. Yeah. We are projecting a $20,000 increase, and this is accounted for specifically um, on the town council services. We have an increase in the number of uh, litigation issues before the town. And then on the Special Labor Council, we have 
at least three contract negotiations, um, one of which we project may end up in arbitration. And then human resources, uh, personal services, only a 2% increase. And then the <coughs> compensation contingency uh, is going down by 35%. And the reason being, you may recall this, last year as we're finalizing the budget, we put the salary for three firefighters under the personnel contingency. We successfully secured a grant for that, and we have reduced the contingency by that amount, um, 175,890. Mr. Kamal, if we can yes. go back a little bit for one second. Tim, Tim, do you have some of your colleagues here with you this evening? Yes, sir. This is the so for those of you that are new to this, this should be a, a free for all, not a total free for all. He'll go crazy, but a free for all <laughs> of ideas. And if somebody has a concern or an opinion, now is the time to raise your hand. Okay, that doesn't mean we're going to solve it tonight, but we need to know if any individual managing a group or a department or a piece of a department or any of that. If you have an issue, now's the time to get it on the table. We want this to be a very collegial, wide open thing. So Tim, for your team, which encompasses a couple of folks, do you guys feel comfortable with what he's projecting or what he's talking about for these various budgets? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. So you feel good about it? Yes, sir. Nothing's missing, like it's going to be a problem for us going forward. We've covered minor costs of the audit. Uh, increase and we've covered costs to do roll out more modules of munis which has been a major investment for us and that's in there as uh, item carried forward from last year okay and we're probably going to do this again at some point between now and may but it's just you know just want everybody to feel free to just say no that's crazy i don't want to do that and raise your hands Let's you know what i'll invite john niece who's sitting in the back to comment he's he's the one who has the increase in the assessing and uh is responsible for supporting our position in these tax cases and the appeals that we have to fight. Anything to add, Jeff? Nope. Okay. Okay, good. Moving on. Human resources is good. Is HR? Yeah. I, I gave the update on HR. Okay. Information technology. IT. Gosh. Expense side um, held the increase to 1% at $5,308. Um, really, no major changes. Um, there's two or three cost drivers that um, contributed mostly to that increase, and then there were a number of offsets through cost containment and uh, contract negotiations in other places. But uh, really, that 1%, no, no major, no major change. If I may, through the chair, um, through the budget process, we have encouraged Josh to spend some time with his counterpart on the school side to see uh, if there are any opportunities to collaborate <coughs> in a couple of their initiatives. Uh, Josh's original budget um, was, I think as you can see, was higher than what the town manager is recommending. And we're thinking that perhaps we may be able to uh, make him whole uh, if there's an opportunity for him to collaborate with uh, Ashok from the school side. All right. Good. Hey, we. Town clerk and her clerk and elections. Good evening. Uh, so, as you can see with town clerk side, uh, we have a decrease in expenses. We did find a few efficiencies over the course of the year. To find myself and find little things we can do to make things a little bit cheaper, including more electronic transmission of uh, notices and things like that. Uh, the slight increase due to personnel services, 1.4 is just due to stipend potentially coming online for uh, for employees, including myself, the potential of having my certified Massachusetts municipal clerk status within the next fiscal year. Uh, as for elections and registration, as many of you have heard from me before, when it comes to elections, uh, budgeting for it is kind of like a roller coaster. 
Uh, you have the years where you're just going to have a town meeting and a town election, and then you have the years where you're going to have primaries and presidential elections and early voting and everything else in between. Special town meetings. That as well, and special town elections. And special town uh, elections. Monday, 7 a.m. Yes. Please remember to show up. Often. Uh, so if you actually look and see the, uh, the numbers from FY19, where we also had a similar number of elections as we're going to have for this coming fiscal year, it's very close in number. The reason that there is a slight increase from that year is primarily due to the increase in the minimum wage. Sir? Connor, you, uh, your position is voted on a town meeting to set the annual salary of elected officials. That's You're correct. It. Uh, that's the only elected official in town that gets paid. That's uh, a full-time position. Um, does this budget anticipate a passage of an article that you're considering? Yes, it would anticipate a passage of an article and then of roughly about a 3% increase. Uh, but it's obviously open to town meeting to decide whether or not they deem me worthy. But that number's in here, so it won't be a surprise. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So your election registration, you're there too, right? You covered that? Yep. Land use? On the land use side this year, uh, there are no changes to positions or programs or services, so it's level service uh, with an increase in um, in the personal services due to um, uh, merit raises from this current year, and uh, some we have blessed with long-time employees who are still grandfathered under the, under the longevity portion of our handbook, and so there's a little bit of that as well. Excellent. How are we doing on the 51 and a half, whatever that's called? Is that well funded and that covers a lot of stuff for us yeah, actually two of our positions uh their salary is solely funded from the building permit fees and not under this budget right so that's separate right and that's 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 whole it's not going to be a problem that's to correct. move anything around good anyone here from the trail committees i don't see anyone green, green committee there's nothing yeah. zeros across it's no <coughs> no one from trails okay good moving on town hall yeah, in, in fact, if the board has any questions on the trail committees, um, Elaine, the assistant town manager, may be able to answer those questions. So there's $36,000 there. That's the open space. Yeah. I'm going to ask you. So as, as well as open space. Yeah. What is the open space? So this year, open space is proposing to do some maintenance on property under their control and management. Um, they haven't done that before, but they feel a huge need, as you saw Ed earlier tonight, talking about removal of invasive species, uh, cleaning up the properties, doing some trail work. So they are deciding to take on some management responsibilities that they have had um, and finally putting some, some effort into it. Same goes for um, the Trail Coordination Management Committee. They are taking on the management responsibilities that Upper Charles did before. So it's being passed on to the TCMC and Upper Charles is just gonna focus on creation of the Upper Charles Trail. So I'm a little confused about those numbers though. Upper Charles has got a $2,200 variance, $2,300 variance downward. And the, up, the Trails Coordination Management is kicking in 36, which is the first year really, right? So, Upper, Ch Upper Charles is still getting $50,000, correct? They're, they're spending that on uh, basically design and engineering for the Upper Charles. For the Upper Charles. And then we're adding to that the new organization, the $36,000 for that organization, correct? Some of that comes from the Upper Charles, but it is new expense. And Jane's good with her number? In fact, yeah, in fact, through the chair, leading to the formulation of the budget, Elaine and I sat down with the chairs of all the three committees and we went through the budget and distributed it as is shown now. And Peter's good with his number. Peter's good with his number, Jane is good with his number, and open space are good. Town Hall? Town Hall? Yeah, I, I can no change in the expenses. Okay. Uh, other general government? No change in the expenses. We got a forty thousand dollar increase in water enterprise and fire protection. Right. Yeah. That's that's the transfer from water enterprise to fire protection. From what? Yeah. It's the transfer from the water enterprise for f uh, fire protection. This is the long-standing discussion regarding 
um, some payment that was arrived at several years ago. It's two. Yeah. As you, you, I think you were saying it's to the water enterprise yes. for hydrants. Yes. So the general government pays the water enterprise a per hydrant fee for all the hydrants in town to support that as a public service that for fire protection, which is shouldn't be borne by the people who buy water to make coffee and take showers. So the hydrant fee is separate, and the the rate per meter was set several years ago and this year they did a census of the hydrants and found out we have more hydrants than we thought we had and that's why this amount is going up is that right john absolutely correct so so water enterprise which is a separate form of taxation through the water enterprise fund for ratepayers right right that's going to have an increase in pressure upward to cover this forty six thousand dollars is that correct it will receive the forty thousand six hundred and sixty four dollars from the general fund into its revenue stream. A water water enterprise gets the cash and the, the town funds pay that cash. Correct. So that's why it's a forty thousand dollar increase on the budget line. But it's, a 40, 000, it's a forty thousand it's a forty thousand dollar increase, as Tim said. We went out and we did a GPS location of all our hydrants and we discovered the the actual number as opposed to the number that's been so it's fair that all of us are paying into the water enterprise mm -hmm. for that i agree okay makes sense good police <laughs> overall increase of uh, 1.6 uh, percent uh main increases uh due to uh, cda agreements coal is tall walks is really pretty stack increase and uh, across the uh, additional also, we added the police department. Uh, uh, we are uh, uh, slowly identifying as we move out of the EMT uh, uh, realm and not requiring all the EMT train, so it's not to see that through attrition, Good. Uh, saving us money. Good. Thank you. Communications. Megan. <coughs> Welcome. I don't think I've had you in front of us before. Uh -huh. All right, let's see what you got. <laughs> <laughs> She's so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so it is um, a 15% overall increase for the communications budget. Um, but most of that personal services and absorbing this current year's um, contract negotiations, as well as the new salary position that we didn't have a line for in the past, um, as well as trying to, as far as expenses, We'll work towards sustaining ourselves and be less of a, an offshoot of mostly the police department because we live there. Um, but to you know sustain ourselves in the sense of supplying ourselves and um, also looking to um, start a community outreach type program. Um, police have one, fire have one on their own, but nobody knows who we are. So yeah. we want to get our faces out there and, and get the residents to realize or to you know learn what we do. Okay. So one additional position is in that 65K? Not a full position. Essentially what it was was the director's position that was created. So it, the, the, the dispatch supervisor position was essentially eliminated. And then the difference in salary is added in, as well as the contracts. And then the outreach is some of that money in the 25, plus just being more independent department yeah. from the police. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense, thank you. Chief Slamman. Good evening. Good evening. Um, for my personnel budget, the uh, main change going into FY21 is we received the grant for the uh, staffing for adequate firefighter emergency response grant, which is uh, implementing four firefighters this year. Um, as Kamala stated, there's some movements of money that fulfilled this year's obligation and then it's carried into FY21. Um, it fits the plan that we talked at town meeting about. There was three in last year's and one proposed for next year's in the uh, data that I proposed to town meeting. So we have all four as part of the grant, which um, thanks to a lot of hard work between Ben and my deputy, it gets a 75% uh, was Ben reimbursement on that. Yes, 75%. 75% reimbursement for uh, the uh, three, two fiscal years and then 30% for the last fiscal year. So it's about half a million dollars of cost that is covered in that piece of it. It's in this. It's in this. Okay, Chief, hang on one sec, please. Mr. Kamala says a 266K increase 
and there's some money elsewhere on the revenue side to offset that based on this grant? Correct. Yes. Okay. And then there's a 42,000, sorry, go ahead on the expense side. Uh, so overtime is the next part of what you have in the personnel number. Uh, there's no change in the overtime budget at all. There's a slight rounding uh, number. I've done some e reallocations with the uh, funding for some additional training and shift coverage designed to improve the effective response, response force outcomes, all in the same number from last year. And then expenses, good. Uh, expenses, the increase to uh, recent challenge areas in my last two uh, fiscal budgets. Uh, vehicle maintenance has been the biggest. Uh, last year I actually spent about $71,000 on something that I set aside about $40,000 for. So vehicle maintenance has been challenging. It's been challenging for a couple of years. Um, and I'm adjusting the budget to capture that. It's just not creeping back yet. I actually put in about 50, anticipating that a new ladder truck and some other equipment uh, will give us some relief on what it costs when I do a chassis inspection that the work done each year. So uh, that's, that's why you're seeing that number. Uh, contracted services has been an increasing um, cost for me. New firefighters are impacting the expenses. Um, the example would be uh, the equipment we get to onboard them is about um, $16,000 worth of equipment. And then the rotation that I do annually, I have five sets of turnout gear, which keeps our turnout gear compliant through a 20 year cycle. We have a number of firefighters now where we need to kick that up to six sets of gear. So we you saw about a $3,500 bump up in that number um, versus having an annual capital number. Um, RMS, we've put in some uh, money for training and implementing the program. Uh, emergency management, I, we went from no budget ever in that area, but some of the equipment that we're maintaining going on, we started to invest in, and when we do some training, it helps facilitate <coughs> the emergency management team that gets together each year. Cistern maintenance, it's never been done. I annually go out, we do the best we can to patch together a system that, and uh, I've spoken to some other towns that are similar to ours and uh, got some numbers from them and plan on, uh, that I asked for $5,000 that are literally going to a uh, cistern up on Wordy Circle that is non-operable. Um, so I've got some estimates to start there and each year, uh, this year within my budget I went down to Washington and repaired a cistern. Uh, it's just something that's never, it's called for on the planning board and we've never maintained it. So that's just an added item. It's, it's never been covered by anybody. And finally, an employee development program. Uh, there's a couple pieces of this. It's a promotional process I have to do every three years. Um, in the last couple of years, what I did was I had a promotional process and I took the people that were successful and I sent them for additional training to help them so that in their career development, employee development, they're more prepared when the opportunity of a promotion comes so they're just not sitting on the shelf. The, the feedback I got on that, um, they don't get paid. I paid for them to travel to FDIC for our instructor training. Uh, they did hands-on training with experts from across the country and it was really uplifting to them. Real positive feedback to me and the town manager on getting that program implemented. So I'd like to kind of more formalize it in the budget and not have it a once every three year piece. So uh, <clears throat> in speaking to a couple of the firefighters that went out to Indianapolis, they came back completely rejuvenated, re-energized, enthusiastic. I thought that was worth its weight in gold, that, that program. I've been, I've been there as a, as a uh, <clears throat> not as a participant, but as a witness. I happened to be out there one year and, and uh, I caught a bunch of it. It's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty cool. It uh, is. Yeah. It changes your mindset. Yep, it does. <clears throat> and that's it other than capital. Of course. I'm not sure we're doing capital. All right. Thanks, Chief. Sealers of sealer of weights and measures. Looks like there's a zero there, so we don't really have to talk too much about that. Unless is someone here for them? Animal control. <coughs> Mr. Proctor is not here. The minus. Do we have enough money there to make sure that uh, we keep everything going the way we want it to go, based on all that we've gone through the last couple of years? Animal control. Yep. I don't know. We don't have someone here to speak of it, do we? Yeah, yeah, we manager. Yeah, Elena and I can speak to it if you have any questions. Okay. Do we have enough money? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, the town expects the animal control department to really make sure everything's good, right? We don't want to, do, I don't want to bring up topics, but we all know what I'm talking <laughs> about. We cannot have that again, so we have to be aggressively doing our, that thing. So everyone feels good about it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And we're skipping 300 and 800. We're going to 410. Correct? Mr. Kamala, why not speak quick? 300 and yes. 800? Correct. Uh, 410 Engineering and Facilities Public Works. Mr. Westerling. <coughs> Uh, for 10, or Mr. For the 20, but that's okay. I'll go first. Um, overall, the uh, the increase 2.3 is within the guide, guideline from um, town manager from the selectmen. Um, there's a decrease in expenses, a minor decrease. Um, it's it's a um, personnel services is an increase. We we had some um, rearranging in in the department from from um, employees. Um, we, we changed a salary po uh, position, hourly position to salary. Um, we have additional part-time services for when the library um, opens on Sundays. Um, but overall, it's a it's a kind of level level service budget. Um, Mr. Kamala, wasn't there a recent announcement about some uh, funding? In that regard, I believe you are referring to the email that was shared last night. Yeah. Um, through the chair, Dave uh, Brian is referring to the insurance uh, decision regarding the floor at uh, the center school. Yes. Um, one of the one of the services facilities provides is you know uh, coordinating with with Meyer on. Insurance claims, uh, as well as with the money, was very helpful. Uh, just today, the the Maya approved the uh, the claim for replacing the gym floor. Uh, so that contractor can't start to work upon notice from the town. The the question, um, I guess. Uh, is that a so question that we're going to ask here, or is that a question we're going to speak to at another time? We, we can make it public, okay. since, since also Jay is here. Uh, okay. Yeah. I think that's great that we're yeah. getting that floor yeah. taken care of because we can still use that. The kids can obviously still use that. Parks and Rec can use that. And Dave, you've been through hell and back here in the last six months. And to pull that off at the same time you did everything else with the corridor project, uh, you're doing a fantastic job. And I, I spent a lot of time with Dave Del Torio here in the last few months and uh, really was very, very impressed with everything he's done. So I'm glad you got that done, too. That's great. Great news. Thank you. Um, and, and overall, the um, what, what I'm trying to do is, you know, the, the cost per square foot for custodial services, really the, 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 the caretake of the buildings, um, has pretty much maintained from fiscal year 16 to 20, uh, 19, from fiscal year 19 to 20, the, uh, the square footage of buildings that facilities maintains has doubled gone from 100 to 200,000 um, square feet with center school included in there from uh, last year. So we're, we're maintaining the same service in these buildings and, and that kind of, you know, trying to rearrange some of the positions. And, and we added a, a second shift custodian this year, which also um, it saves some money uh, with custodial services at the DPW. Um, but it also, we, we've also been finding um, they provide, town employees provide better service um, than our custodial um, contracts. Um, so overall, it's, it's been a little bit of an increase in service, uh, personnel services, but we're maintaining the same level of service. Um, and we're also working with the town manager um, for a strategic plan for the facilities department um, so the town engineer can, can get into a little more town engineer stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And through the chair, if I may, it, it, it's, it needs to be said, um, through the collaboration between John and Dave, the second shift custodian is also, our, is also the town's recycling attendant. Oh. So it's saving two purposes. So good job on the custodial side as well. You good? I am good. All right. Go, Dave. Public Works Administration. Good evening. Through Good the evening. chair, thank you for this opportunity to discuss our highlights. Uh, 
what we find for the, the big changes in our operating budgets. We're looking at a $10,000 increase in our equipment supplies budget to replace a mower that's used in the parks and cemeteries. We are asking for a $10,000 increase in our highway maintenance supplies budget to purchase a coal planning attachment for our holder tractor, which will reduce the time necessary to patch our road, roadway pavement and reduce our cost for man hours and materials. We have an increase uh, to represent the increase in fuel costs. Our payment management program, we are asking for a, an increase of $50,000. And the engineers recommend an investment in our payment management plan to maintain or improve our payment condition index, or our PCI, and to reduce our backlog. Last year, we invested $1.15 million in our payment management plan, and the result of not approaching the engineer's recommended level is that our PCI dropped from 73 to 70. We are requesting sufficient funds to invest the minimum recommendation of $1.2 million when combined with our Chapter 90 funding, but this will still result in a payment condition index decrease. It would require $300,000 of additional funding to maintain our PCI, our payment condition index, at 70 and an additional $800,000 to bring our PCI back up to 74. So we're looking for the minimum recommendation, but we're still going to see a, a, a minor decrease in our payment condition index. In our tree warden budget, I'm putting forward a strategic initiative which is requesting an increase of $200,000, bringing the budget from $50,000 up to $250,000. The FY appropriation of $50,000 is already fully expended in already seven months. And that represents the removal of about 30 trees per year. A representative survey of Hopkinton's urban forest reveals that we have approximately 1,300 trees that should be removed because they are either dead or dying. At an average cost for tree removal, including prevailing wage and police details, we have a long-term obligation of over $2 million in our urban forest. This increase represents the first of a 10-year plan to address the removal of trees, the development of a tree management plan, and the creation of a tree planting plan. Uh, the, the final increase that we see is uh, our contractual increases for the curbside collection of municipal solid waste and recyclables and the disposal of municipal solid waste at Wheel of Raider. So, Mr. Cavallo, on the <coughs> increase on the, for the waste collection and disposal, do we have a contract with them? Y yes, we do. So why, why are we going up? Um, it's per the contract that we negotiated. You may recall, I think the last two or three years, uh, it's either we have kept the costs lower or decreased them, or get a minimal, minimal increase. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to, to the chair, that's what I was going to say. You know, so many towns are having to uh, give up their single, uh, single stream recycling because um, the uh, facilities just can't handle it. So I, I commend you for even just being able to uh, continue getting the service. Thank you. A number of years ago, we took out the risk. A number of years ago when the, uh, when the market was good for recyclables, communities were realizing revenue. But now that the market has crashed for recyclables, those communities are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars per year to dispose of the recyclables. We took that risk out, so we are market neutral when it comes to recyclables. So that's why we are only seeing uh, contractual minimal costs per year. We also have a contract at Wheelabrator, which goes up according to the P um, CPI. Mr. Chairman, this, this seems to be about an $8 a month cost Per, per household pickup, really, really low compared yeah. to other communities. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's, it, it, all we can figure is that because they don't have to bill everyone and do the whole administrative process, they're able to do this much, much more cheaply. And it's, uh, by being part of the tax base, it's a tax deductible expense to our residents. And if we're billed separately, it would not be tax deductible. Okay. Uh, John, on personal services for Public Works Administration, increase of twenty-one thousand dollars. What is that for? That's essentially merit increases and longevity payments. 
merit for the longevity of the staff. Okay. Um, the 49000 we covered. Is Mr. Regan aware of this $200,000 increase in expenses for the tree warden department? And does he approve of this? He'll get me on Sunday. Have we talked to Mr. Regan about this? He's been very adamant as a resident and advocated for some kind of department to be started and a true management plan to be put in place, which just looks like this is going in that direction. But I just want to make sure he's included in this discussion. We haven't finalized anything yet. And, you know, he's spent two or three of his nights with us here in the last year advocating for what I think you're proposing with this 200K. In, informally, yes, John has had uh, on and off conversations with Mr. Regan. However, in terms of the process, um, you'll recall you have requested the town manager working with DPW to formulate a plan. Right. Part of that process will involve extended discussions with uh, Mr. Regan yeah, and, and others in town. On board. He's a professional yeah. in the business mm -hmm. and he's been very kind to help us out. So, if, so if, if I may, uh, to the chair, to, to piggyback on that, how are we doing with getting the, uh, the truck that we approved uh, last year? That's been a year now. So Mr. Regan has been very closely working with uh, Ben and myself. Uh, we are challenged at finding a used vehicle that will both meet our needs, has the uh, extended reach that we need, and also is going to be a safe vehicle for us. So he's been working very closely with Ben and I to put together uh, what we're looking for in helping us to determine which vehicles are available. He even brought in uh, an industry uh, book to help us with dealers that deal in those used vehicles. So we're, we're working very closely with, with Mr. Regan and trying to trying to bring that home for us. We, we have a dedicated staff at the DPW, as you know, and we have a lot of people there that are eager for this new vehicle to come in and receive the training so that they can help out with the, the urban forest that we have and the needs and the trees. If I may, I believe Mr. Westerling is very modest. He also has attended many training sessions to make sure that we fulfill the goal that was set by the select board uh, for the town manager. Thank you. So in years past, uh, Mr. Westerling and I have had some pretty healthy discussions at this evening's form, format or whatever and outside the room. Um, but this is clearly a, line, a budget with a lot of line items, all that falls under your purview. And there's a lot of increases, but this is also a department that really feels the growth of Hopkinton and has a lot more work because of the growth of Hopkinton, like everybody else for that matter in the room. We're all feeling that, and that's why there's not a huge pushback in some of these things, because we get it, <coughs> or at least I get it, and I think my colleagues do too. So uh, no fights tonight, Josh. It's kind of boring. We haven't really capitalized yet. <laughs> well, yeah, that's why I used to go out of it. John, did you touch on the Cemetery Commission? No, there's no changes yeah. on that. It did not. Good there. All right, so you're good? Yes, thank you. All right. John. Thank you for the opportunity tonight. Uh, you're uh, doing our best to control our budget. We have a 1.6% of our increases. And then we've worked with the existing budgets uh, to find savings. We're looking at, uh, you know, we've digitized some of our uh, submittals and we've gone to a digital inspection software process which is saving us money on supplies it's more uh, time effective so uh, we're continuing to work on uh, buying those savings and then you know, providing extra service to the, uh, the residents with the existing budget we have thank you amy hi how are you ah uh, just fine thanks how are you guys <laughs> Um, so our biggest uh, change this year is in personal services. Um, it's a staffing request that we've made um, that brings the senior center consistent with the town and its support of staff salaries. We have four salaries or four part-time individuals who've been paid through, um, been supported by our friends group, um, and we're asking that the town assume the full responsibility for the staffing of the senior center. Um, so that is our biggest increase as far as our expenses. They've paid, uh, stayed pretty much the same. Um, the biggest difference in when you see the negative is that that was our um, security camera. Um, was the cost that was done for this year. So that won't be an ongoing cost. If I may. You may. Um, through the chair, I want to take this opportunity, in fact, to celebrate the wonderful 
um, efficient and forward-looking partnership between the town and the friends of the seniors. What needs to be said is, as part of transitioning the responsibility for paying the, for the four part-time staff persons, you know what the friends are doing? They are assuming responsibility, financial responsibility, for funding programming, which I think is a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. The town invests, I think, overall less than $25,000 towards programming. And the, sen and the friends of the seniors have identified this as a key need and have agreed that they would put their res resources towards programming. Good. Awesome. Is that why the expenses is down at 21 grand? Is that part of it? No, that's the security cameras that were put in last year's that are being installed this year. Okay. So that was a one-time cost. So, Mr. Kamalo, on this transfer of uh, responsibility from the friends to the town, uh, for staffing for the senior center I, I, it sounds like you and amy have obviously talked about this and worked through this and everybody's everyone's in agreement on this you're in agreement on this yes and elaine you're in agreement on this see i'm trying to start a fight here folks and no one's fighting <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're good on that yes we're good um the council on aging is great with this and uh, so so is the um so so are the friends of the senior center okay thank you Youth and, fam <coughs> Excuse me, youth and Family Services. Good evening. Good evening. Um, youth and Family Services offers free and confidential support for the community, including information and referral to a host of mental health issues, counseling, case management, crisis intervention, and prevention services. For many families, these services fill a critical need in times of crisis and have become a safety <coughs> net to many. The proposed increases are driven by the increase in requests for services and can be primarily attributed to two requests. Um, in personnel services, 80% of the personnel services increase is an increase in hours for the youth services counselor um, from 20 hours to 30 per week. And um, the remainder of that is just the personnel of being down a director and then hiring a director and, and those those expenses going up and down accordingly. Um, school referrals for children in need of mental health services have been increasing. Um, as the school population increases and more people have learned about the service that um, my predecessor did a lot to set up and um, make a community fixture. Um, and as more word of mouth grows, um, the increase in hours for the um, youth services counselor will allow for the increased programming and events as well as offering more clinical hours to the community um, and so that that explains the um, personal costs the expenses 100% um, of the proposed expense increase 13,000 in expenses is to fund the contract with interface referral services we started that program back in September um, within three months' time, there were 39 um, referrals made for outpatient mental health services um, for residents in need. 19 of those were ages 6 to 12. The remainder of those minus five adults were teens and young adults. So really, it's, it's the community's children that are being referred to mental health service with the leading issues of anxiety and depression. Um, and two of those callers expressed suicidal ideation at the time of their contact. So it's a life-saving service, or has the potential to be. And uh, right now it's funded through an earmark. And frankly, that gives me palpitations. Because, <laughs> because when I think of earmarks being somewhat fickle, they could go away. And, um, and I, would, I would hate to see the service go away, where it's become such a vital one so quickly. So in three months' time, 39 referrals, and you might ask, well, what's the typical? The typical is 50 per community of this size. And so we've already utilized um, almost the full 13,000. I think it's 8,500 in three months' time of the cost um, of that 13,000. The contract is 13,000 for a year, no matter how many referrals we have. But cost ratio, it's 8,500 already um, that they've spent in providing services to the community. And so the, the, the value of it is very high as well, um, not to mention the value of human lives, but if we're talking dollars, <laughs> that's what it looks like. Um, and, and so that's our request um, for this um, fiscal year. 
You know, uh, uh, this is this isn't me or, or Mr. Hurt talking right now. Normally, but you know, is the increase to thirty hours enough? Should we be more progressive and and put make this a full time position so we're not worried about? That's this? what I was going to bring up. We've had this same discussion. <laughs> right. So why don't we just go ahead? You know, this is one of those years that. If you know, again, we were talking about the, the growing community, and, and you know, and and you know, this, you know, the youth services council, it's huge, you know, and and the you know, and mental health intervention, it's 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 so needed, you know. Should we really look at it, you know, at at this point and think about a full time position? That's it. So maybe we should, but we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're we're watching our nickels and dimes, and these are these are our professionals, and these are the budget they're putting forth. Far be it from us to tell them they should add more. Uh, maybe uh, well, in adversity, we could tell them to take some out. That's we could. We could suggest. Yeah. If, but um, so, but my point on all this is when we had this discussion three or four years ago. I'm not sure you may have just missed it by a year. Um, at that time, there was a lot of discussion about well, is our youth and family services going to become a a private practice, if you will, uh, and are the taxpayers going to be funding that? I advocated that we should, but some of us at the time mm -hmm. didn't want to, and that's why it was a 20-hour position. I'm pretty sure that's how we kind of settled on a 20-hour part-time position because we were concerned about the liability uh, of the community, et cetera, but some of us were concerned, I think, at the time. So, so and there's a big difference between private practice um, counseling and the, the services that the Youth Services Counselor primarily provides. She's, she's doing a lot of the safety net stuff for families that are experiencing crisis. And so whether it's financial need, whether it's a connection to a utility, food resources, um, you know, and with our food stamps program shrinking um, and families getting far less. And so, you know, you're thinking of family of five living off of like $300 in food stamps a month. I don't know how you feed teenagers with that. Um, you know, scrambling for food resources and, and getting people connected to those resources. It takes a lot of time and effort. And that's where I think, um, you know, the majority of, of that position's time goes is chasing down these resources. And let me tell you, Colleen Souza does a fabulous yeah. and amazing job. She goes above and beyond the call of duty, yeah, finding exactly. furniture and, you know, all kinds of things for families to keep mm -hmm. them afloat and, and to, you know, preserve their dignity and their value and their self-worth during really difficult times. So, um, you know, I, I'm just, I'm blown away. So. <laughs> So, to Mr. Ted Stone's point, so this budget that you're requesting in these numbers, this you feel is satisfactory for where we are as a community and the needs that the community has? We're engaging in a strategic planning process, so I, I fully believe, you know, that will, that will flesh all that out. And so I can't promise you I won't be back at some point. <laughs> but, but as, of, as of right now, I think this, this will get us through this year. And I, and I didn't want to you know, be greedy. I know there's a lot of other departments that that are up against it too. And so, um, but this what I, f I felt was the most responsible choice that I could come forward, um, especially, um, you know, given the increase in need and the utilization of that interface service that is just, it's blown my mind that 39 in three months time um, where other communities are seeing like 50 in a year, so. Um, and, and part of that is, is the promotion, but we haven't even done the full scale promotion yet. <laughs> that's coming so so I'm appreciative of your conservative approach uh, but please uh, if something happens off cycle and you need to come see us between now and the next next year don't hesitate because we really cannot put a price on on our our youth lives or or anyone's lives I thank you so, for that support so I mean, I you think have our support wonderful uh, I mean it feels amazing to, to know that yeah. we serve with that and it's nice to see that you come up and start low and titrate. You know, we'll titrate, titrate up as we need, but, um, you know, you're doing a great job and you're doing a great service. So thank you very, thank you very much. much. For the chair? Yes, sir. Um, I forgot you were down there. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, um, do you foresee that with the increased need, that do you see this being enough? I mean, do you see the, the increase keep on going higher? I think to look for other revenue sources is important. And so um, without 
you know, going into huge detail, uh, uh, here we are looking for other ways to, to fund other elements of the department, pre particularly prevention services. Mm -hmm. And so we're building the coalition and, um, so that it can become more sustainable and perhaps apply for other funds and federal funds in the future um, so that our time as clinicians can be devoted back into the clinical work and the needs-based assistance work and the prevention work that can be larger than life in itself. We, we want to prevent kids from coming to us because they're healthy and well. Uh, you know, um, that might take a chunk off. So I, I think it, it'll be difficult to know before the strategic plan, especially with my being so new to the community, sure. where it all rests. Um, but so I, think, I, mean, I think what you've heard from a lot of us is that we just don't want, um, due to lack of funding, a person in need to not get those services. And, and I think that the, the two employees you have in that department, we wouldn't let somebody <laughs> not be served. I think, you know, we're working pretty hard. I don't think we'd sleep at night if we knew there was somebody out there and we wouldn't turn a blind eye to them. So we find a way to connect them with something. And, um, you know, I'll be back on Tuesday night to share more with you about Interface and, and more about what the department's been doing lately. Um, and we have a procurement and grants group over here. That might yeah. be able to help out. I, I've been, I've been <laughs> very close to that. Very close to all the Yes. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks for it. Really, thank it's you. a tough job. Thank you. Good. Veteran services. The assessment uh, by the district is going up by two thousand dollars, and the chapter one fifteen benefits are going up by five percent. Our caseload is going up, which is what we expected. And we have charged the uh, Veterans District Office to do more public education, especially with regard to the veterans coming from the Iraq war. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that that's money well spent. Uh, library. All right. Um, good evening. Good evening. We have a 2.3% increase, which is within budget targets. It is approximately $13,000. Um, the majority of that, about two-thirds, is in the staffing line that is uh, raises, and it's also um, some adjustments to uh, estimates that were made for new positions. There were some new positions in the FY20 budget. I estimated what we would be paying them as we have gone through the hiring process. I have adjusted that upward, um, and that makes that difference. The rest of the increase is about a $4,000 increase in our line for collections purchases. Um, about half of that is, in a sense, offset because we are now bringing in about $2,000 of revenue to the town annually, which we were not before. Our, um, in printing, photocopying, and faxing fees. Our um, lost items fines and replacement fines go into a revolving fund that we spend right back on materials. It's actually not reflected in these numbers. It's a separate thing. Um, but our printing, photocopying, faxing used to be collected by the friends because they paid for the photocopier lease. Um, now the town covers all of those expenses, and so the, the money we collect goes to the general fund. So that's a new uh, revenue stream. Um, so that $4,000 is basically we're required to spend a certain amount on materials every year by the state. It goes up as our appropriation from the town goes up. Um, the town funds less than half of what we actually are required to spend. Um, so I, you know, throw a little bit in there. I'd like to try and keep the town's contribution about keeping pace. We're spending about $50,000 annually from other sources on materials to meet that spending requirement. Um, so we're asking for about 41000 total this year um, towards that from the town side. Thanks, Heather. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mr. Kamalo, historic commission celebrations, townwide celebration for Hopkins and Day, historic district commission, those are all zeros, so we're good there, right? We're good, and I'm sure there will be a question as to uh, whether this means that we will not have Hopkins and Day celebrations. We will. Well, it's already paid for. <laughs> all right. Um, we're not doing anything on debt service tonight, right? Mr. Kamalo, you want to hear about I can give you a little on debt service. Right. Yeah. 30,000 feet. Yes, sir. So there's a big increase in debt service because it includes several things that are not in there now. The first thing is the nine and a half million that is going to the ballot on Tuesday, so that assumes that's Monday. gonna happen. Monday, Monday, sorry. I'll be there Monday. I won't be there Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> so that assumes that that's gonna happen. Uh, that starts out at about $740,000 in 21. 
and tapers off to $140,000 by the time it's paid off in 2050. That also includes money for the $15 million that's in this budget for center school and the $4 million that's in there for school roofs. So this is the number we'll have if everything on the capital page gets approved. If some things on the capital page do not get approved, this number will go down. It won't help our situation in the budget for the schools much because 19 of the 20 million is excluded from the levy in the center school yeah. and the school roofs. I can almost guarantee you that that number is going to go down on the capitals. Just that, and that's almost. why I wanted to tell you that this is a variable number. Yeah. So it won't affect our ability to fund the schools, but it will affect tax impact if it goes down. Mr. Tedstone, so I, I'm having a really hard time, and I know we're not going to get into capital articles tonight because we don't have time to do that tonight. But I don't think we have socialized this $15 million for the center school project at all. I, I just think that that number just came from somewhere. Uh, I, don't, I know nothing about that $15 million, full disclosure. I don't know if any of my colleagues know anything about this $15 million. But all of a sudden, we're all talking about this $15 million we're going to work on, spend on the center school. I just I think we're just way ahead of ourselves in this one, and I don't know why we're doing that. I don't want to debate it tonight, but I'm just telling you, if I don't know anything about it and my colleagues don't know anything about it, I don't think the town knows anything about it either. Through the chair, we agree with you, Mr. Hay. Then but why you, is it in here? That's okay. the reason. <laughs> it, is, it is in here because we have a calendar for our budget and for our town meeting articles. That's why it's in here. However, we do agree. I think it's going to be here a year or two from now when we fully socialize what we're we, going to do with the building. We agree with you. However, mm -hmm. for well, why is it in here? Because we have to comply with the town meeting as well as budget calendars. So we're holding a place for town meeting? I don't know. We're just going to guess. Yeah. We're, just, we're not going to approve it. I don't get that. I just <laughs> don't get that. Yeah. Or it's next year. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So but for us to make the decision that it was going to miss a year, when the, when the yeah. public building committee took a position, we felt we had to include it, and we're telling you it's in this number, but and it's variable depending on what you decide. But what we decided as the select board was that the public bu or permanent building committee was going to go off and do their thing and study at center school and they did that and they had the other committee and they came back and they were going to come back with some recommendations and someday somebody was going to come back to this board and make a recommendation this is what we think we need to do and this is the money we think we need to bring a town meeting that has not happened yet we have agreed yes that has not happened then why are we this talking about 15 no. million dollars it's easier Ryan. to take it out than to put it back in. If you decide you want to do it in April, we won't be able to do it for you. Yeah. But if you decide not to do it in April, we can take it out. We can take it out in a moment. Yeah. But after the third, we can't put it back in. So, so for we're those of us that go to dinner in town and go to get a drink in town and go to the church in town and go to the soccer fields in town and have people chewing on our ears about 15 million bucks for center school that we haven't even talked about yet, it's not that easy. Okay, so I hear your point, but it's not easy for those of us that have to listen to it. And I, with all due respect to everybody in the room and everyone in the community, there's a legit concern people have about 15 million dollars for the center school. Especially since we don't even know what we're going to do with it yet. We're just talking about 15 million bucks. Is it 15 million dollars to turn it into a garden? That Is was the top estimate. And in conservatism, we put the top estimate in there and we highlighted it here so you would see the most shocking number you could see to sensitize you to what the range of possible outcomes are. It's between zero and 15 million. Yeah. And, and, and it's if we had more information or if we could do this a week before town meeting, we would have done this differently. I can think of right now 250 people that would spend $15 million on that building as a town. 250 people tops. Okay, and I've been getting into prediction of how people voted certain things over my 12 years here, and I've rarely missed. The other 17,750 are going to look at that building and say it's $215 million for what? Even if we got some great plans, they're going to say for what? We've got to do a lot better job socializing whatever it is we're going to do. Mr. Hayes. We're going to fight tonight. I know. <laughs>
Through the chair, Mr. Hare, I can. Your point is very well taken. Here's the good thing. Respectfully, can you just be a little bit patient? No. The permanent building committee. The permanent no. building committee. The permanent building committee met two weeks ago. They have identified a company that will help us in moving this discussion forward. To help you along, is it likely that this $15 million is going to be moving forward at this annual town meeting? Highly unlikely. But if that debt service it's, number is in this number right here, and it's in the it's in the net tax impact number that we have to go out and justify to the residents of Hockington, and we have to talk about that dreaded word, the override, as we build up to May, yeah. and it's built on a premise of fifteen million dollars. We're actually not planning on 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 uh, on, on spending or appropriating. Yeah. It took us almost two process. years. It took us almost two years to, to vet out getting a school that we absolutely the replacement school for that. And now we're trying to think that we're going to spend $15 million or, or maybe a little less in, 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 in two months? If I may. This will not fly. If I may, if I may, yeah. let's go back to the beginning of this discussion. We are early in the process. No decisions, final decisions have been made. Let's be consistent with that message. We're early in the process, Mr. Hare. No decision has been made regarding the $15 million. Thankfully, the Permanent Building Committee has started a process that will help us along. Again, highly unlikely that this is moving forward. I'll tell you what is moving forward, our agenda. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what do we have left, Jay? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jay. <laughs> Employee benefits and insurance through the chair. We've discussed these issues as part of the budget discussions over the last three months. We can skip on this. Yeah. 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 If you look, you'll see some numbers that look a little odd. Um, one of the challenges we face this year is that with our, our summer sports events are seasonal. In the past, we probably have between 50 and 75 people who will be taken on as coaches, instructors, administrators. In the past, we've paid them basically through the accounts payable <coughs> and, and finance department as contract people. Um, we quarry them, they give us a tax ID number, we set them up as a vendor, and we pay them. Um, it's been pointed out to us by actually the school human resources department that that is actually not in compliance with the Department of Labor. So going forward now, we have to hire all these folks as um, seasonal employees mm -hmm. and all that. So that's why you see that enormous increase in personal services. Um, and you see it offset in expenses because we're taking, basically we're just switching it from expense to the personal <coughs> service. Um, so that makes up about probably close to $70,000 of that $84,000 increase. The other increases are um, an increase in minimum wage this year. Um, we also had a market adjustment for both the uh, staff members in the department. So their, their hourly rates went up from about 20 an hour to 25, um, which is pretty significant. Uh, quite a budget for that. Um, and also our, our other staffer in the office um, the fact that we're going to be hiring these, these people and going through this hiring process of really a lot of, a lot of people, it's going to require a little more time. So we're, we're going to hire up from 20 hours a week to 30 uh, in anticipation of some increased time and effort that has to be put into this. Um, on the expense side, like I said, probably about $70,000 um, going from expenses to personal services. The other thing we're, we're trying to do this year, coming to John's point, is if you've been at the con this summer, you may or may not notice that a lot of the trees are dying, um, specifically the sugar maple trees, which are literally deteriorating. Um, we've had a lot of concern of residents of protest on that. Uh, we met last summer with uh, Mezit and the rep from Barkley Trees. They put together an estimate for us. And I think we would like to start the process of a real sort of tree management process down the column. I think we want to get ahead of this before 
stuff starts to really look bad. And that's, that's <coughs> probably the biggest increase in the <coughs> our expense line issue. So I don't understand why tree management falls on your budget, not your budget. Parks and Recreation has custody to come. Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec doesn't mow it. No, we pay John to mow. <laughs> so we do a, a intercompany, basically a balance transfer at the end of the year to cover costs for 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 other works to trash the question. Uh, grants also the same thing. That's the way that works. Another reason to develop a park department. Is that <clears throat> yeah, no, I have a few questions. Um, a number of years ago, when, when I uh, was on one of the other boards, we appropriated money and we put 24 trees on the common. Mm -hmm. Between old dying trees and then there's new trees. And the old ones were supposed to have been taken out from time to time. And I don't think that that happened all that often. And is that why new trees are becoming diseased because of the diseased old trees that were there? Or, so, uh, I mean. No, no, that's a good point. Um, since I've been in the position, I think we've removed two trees that were dead or dying um, that I can think of. But honestly, um, what we've been told by both Pete Mezzet and by part of the tree is that this is actually a climate change issue and that certain species of trees in the last 15 to 20 years are now actually um, deteriorating due to climate change is what the experts are saying. So <coughs> I can't comment on any sort of tree plant comment prior to my being here. Um, and we're happy to involve any and all town groups in this process. Because yeah, well, this was one of the trust funds and it was specifically for trees on, Ma on Main Street in the Common, and, and they did buy 24 trees. And okay. one was a tulip tree to match one that's over in the cemetery. The tulip trees are actually very healthy and doing well. Huh? The tulip trees are actually very healthy and doing well. They're doing well, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then there were others, and you can, you can see them. I mean, they're much smaller than, than the big old ones that were we're, we're seized, cons we're but, concerned. Uh, I'm concerned personally about enormous tree limbs falling off and damaging the fountain or damaging a person. Um, and it's, like I said, there are a lot, of, actually a lot of concerned residents who spend a lot of time down there and they really approach us on this and turns out they're right. So we'd like to get in front of that and we'd like to start this year. I have a, I have a question for Andrew, whether for Tim or Mr. Kamalo. Is that the most efficient way? Is that they own the common, but we're paying them and money has to be transferred so it's, instead of having a more straightforward budget that John takes care of all the trees and all the grass and everything else and and we just <coughs> figure that into the thing so we don't have to have to have Fox and Rec going to Bartlett instead of having our own tree people looking at stuff I you know I, I just wonder for efficiency sake through the chair um, the Park and Rec Commission is independently elected we will have to negotiate that uh, we did that with uh, the mowing of the common oh okay mm -hmm. We're right. open to all ideas. <laughs> In some other towns, ideas. public works supports all the fields as well as the common space. Mm -hmm. <coughs> all right. So just a, a quick thought. The trees on the common have been a topic of discussion many times over the years. Um, there are a lot of people very passionate that want to play with the kids at the common. There are a lot of people in the area that just love the mature trees of the common and the canopy that exists today. Uh, it will be a very passionate discussion when we get to it. So we can't, and I know you and the, your colleagues on the board wouldn't just go out and start yak, you know, no, knocking no. down trees because there'll be people chained to those trees. No, no, we would never. We, we actually, we've discussed that, and that's, we're not going to just unilaterally decide, hey, these ones got to go. Let's yeah, we've got to have public hearings and walkthroughs and all kinds of things. And we receive calls all the time from people who think we should have twice as many trees and other from people who think we should have half as many trees. Right. Um, depending on the demographic, your, uh, your, your <coughs> there's a lot of opinions varied. On trees. Trees, trails, and trash. Uh, it's a mix that <laughs> the always talk about. Right There's a ones to stay away from. Mr. Kamala, are we good? We're good. Um, 
Just one more department, water and soil enterprise. Important that John updates the board on the budget for this. Water and sewer. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, the sewer enterprise fund. Um, we have a modest increase for personal services to reflect contractual obligations. And we have a reduction in the expenses. We believe we can realize some savings because we're not sending sewerage to Milford on a regular basis because of the, uh, the vacant properties on South Street. On the water enterprise side, again, we have a modest increase in personal services for contractual obligations. And then on the expenses side, there is a modest increase to reflect increases in our supplies. Uh, Mr. Kamalo, on that, on that end with the water and sewer, this year when we have our audit, are we going to have a different audit company so that, that that's actually going to explain it to us a little bit better this time? Because the last few years, we, we get a number, we get a number, and then we're, we're shocked and have to raise rates. I'm just throwing that out there. Please just keep it in mind when we, when we start to do that again. Yeah, I, I think as we've been saying, um, the town is in a great position. We have a very strong finance team. Uh, they are taking the lead role. Uh, however, if we do need uh, additional support from from the consultant, we, we, will, we will ask for that help. However, the, the, the driver right now will be the, the finance tips. I haven't been pleased with uh, in, in six years being on the board, um, that, that, that the consultant doesn't seem to hit those numbers very well each year. We always, there always seems to be a shock value when they come through. We don't like that. Thank you. Sorry. Good. Good. Thank you. Good. Mr. Kamala, do you want to give us a 30,000 foot overview of these capital items? Um, Got to be quick, though. I'm going home. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've been here since 4.30 today. Yes. I'm going home. Now, I think what we'll do is we will we'll come back next Tuesday. Perfect. To cover the capital items. So noted. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of capital articles, and a lot of them are going to have to be put off. Right? Away. I don't have a yeah. go the increases we're going with and we go out and buy all the shiny stuff yeah. so it's not gonna work. So are we all set? I think we're all I set. I would love to entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. All opposed, it carries. Thank you. Good night. Good evening. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.